going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Amy Ritterbush. Oh, a little louder. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have a slideshow presentation about some of the data we've gathered this fall. Uh, Chuck Joseph is going to present. And then after that, at about 1.30, we're going to get into small groups and we're going to answer some key questions we've identified. We want to get feedback from residents. And then the groups will report at about, we'll do that for about 40 minutes, and then the groups will report out um, what they've talked about in their small groups. Um, and then we'll take your information back and talk about it at our next meetings. So, I wanted to introduce you to the, the Growth Committee was formed by the Planning Board in the uh, summer of 2019. And the aims are to proactively manage growth, uh, enable better planning for town services, identify parcels or zones that may have a significant impact on future growth patterns, um, and to be proactive about maintaining the level of required affordable housing in town. And so I'm the chair, Amy Ritterbush. We also have Finn Perry, who's the vice chair over here. Uh, Muriel Kramer is the clerk. She's not able to be here today. Uh, Chuck Joseph from the Chamber of Commerce. Fran Young, one of the at-large members in the back. Uh, Tim Brennan, member of the police force and also an a at-large member. Michelle Murdoch, an at-large member. Um, and then we have two alternates who had to work today, David Wheeler and Wilson St. Pierre. And we have liaisons from the school committee, Jen Devlin over there in the red scarf. Um, John Katita from the select board, who I think could not make it. And Shaidul Manan from the appropriation committee, who also had to work today. All right, so welcome, and I'm going to turn the mic over to Chuck. Thanks, Amy. Uh, can you all hear me all right? Because I don't, do I need the microphone? Yes. I do. All right, and I'm going to keep the microphone. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to give you some, this is a pretty simple uh, presentation. You're going to get some facts. This little, you know, even living here for as long as many of us have, we think we have a handle on the town and we think we understand where the numbers are. And then you actually dig into the data and you start looking at it. And there are some surprising things that come about. Um, so we'll give you uh, what, where we are today, and then we'll give you a little bit of uh, historical perspective, and we'll also give you some comparable data from some surrounding towns, so we can see how do we measure up relative to other communities in Metro West. Metro West is now considered a legitimate region of the state. We are not Springfield or Albany or Worcester, and we're not Boston, but we're this band right along 495, between 495 and, and 128. So, here's the, the couple of facts on the big picture. As of October, our, our official population was 17,644. We will be topping 18,000, which 20 years ago when I was on the previous growth study committee was exactly where we predicted we would be today. So what do you know, one of those things actually worked out the way it was supposed to. So we are right about this number, and I think that's important. Um, I don't want to say where we're going to end up because that's part of what we're researching is to see what the top number will be, but I think it's fair to say that we have gone through the lion's share of our growth already. There are 6,543 households in Hopkinton. That includes condominiums, it includes single family homes, it includes apartments. And our school population as of I think it was October, uh, is almost 4,000, 3,978. So 3,978, almost 18,000 of uh, total population. We'll get to some of the percentages and what that means and how it compares to other, other communities. One of the interesting things that comes out since Legacy Farms have been kind of a lightning rod because it's been the most densely populated area that we've created in the town, and it was done so on purpose to, to leave a lot of open space around it as well. There's um, a, a significant increase in our school population over the last two or three years. And there is some misinformation flying around about how many kids are coming out of each household at Legacy versus the town at large. And so when we examine the data, in fact, they are almost identical. We have about 441 children from Legacy Farms and when you divide that into the 771 units that are currently permitted, it comes out to about 0.62. Uh, 
when you take the remaining children in Hopkinton and you divide them around uh, over the other 5,000 plus homes, it comes out to 0.6. So it's very consistent in how many school children tend to come out of how many dwelling units. Our town budget is $90 million right now. And our school budget accounts for 49 million of that 90 million. And that's not unusual for New England, and it's certainly not unusual for New England towns where the majority of the revenue comes from residential structures. So where does the 90 million come from? 60 million comes from residential taxes, 12 million dollars comes from commercial and industrial taxes, 10 million comes from state aid, and about eight million comes from motor vehicle excise tax, local receipts, and business, uh, person, business personal property. So if you look at it at a chart, you can see the blue representing residential tra taxes is where the majority of our revenue comes from. It comes from single family homes, tax rates, which I think were 1717 per thousand last year. So how do we compare to neighboring towns? Well, if you look at our population, this is a population chart you're looking at right now. We are at 17,644. We're almost identical to Ashland. Ashland's just a couple hundred people short of us. Uh, Milford is larger at 28,000. Westboro's a little bit larger at 19. Holliston is a little bit smaller. I remember when Holliston was much larger than Hopkinton uh, on a population basis. And of course, Southboro is a little bit smaller than that, and in Upton is about 8,000. When we look at school age children as a percentage of population, it's an interesting, interesting way to look at things. Our school age children are about 23% of our population. That has been consistent over about 10 to 20 years, the, the ratio. So even though our school age children is up around 4,000, which is a lot of school age children, it's in direct proportion as it has been for the past 10 years to our general population. Uh, can we go back one, Amy? Um, just with regard to that, Westboro is at 21%, Milford at 16, 20, 20, 17, 18. So we're on the high end of the norm in terms of the percentage of school children relative to our whole population but we have been consistent in that percentage. Go ahead. Uh, education budget, how much of the budget? We had 49 million out of 90. People say, oh my God, we're out of control. You look at the other towns around us and you can see their percentage of their budget. 55, 51, 59, 58, 55, 69. So we are not out of the norm in terms of out of each dollar how much we're spending on public education as compared to very similar towns. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one that Amy just came up with. What percentage of our population is between the ages of 25 and 34, otherwise known as millennials? They don't live here. They don't. They live in the city. They live near the city. They don't live here. Three percent of our population between 25 and 34. That was a shocker to me. I thought it would be a little bit higher than that. But it's also very consistent with the suburbs. All right? And if any of you have grandchildren or children that have recently gone out of college, about 10 years afterwards, they all stay in close to the city. There's 12 of them in an apartment. And then they figure out that they have to go somewhere else. This is another interesting piece. How much of our population is 55 or older? Or in other words, are we do we have a larger senior population than other towns? Are we similar? Where are we? And we are right there, 40% here in Hockerton, 40% in Westboro, 37, 45, 44, 43, all within that same acceptable price, uh, price range, acceptable age range, where that's pretty consistent. You know, it's pretty consistent. And it, again, I don't want to say this is across the state. This is more of a Metro West kind of look. Go ahead. Now, if you take 55 and you go to 65, those of us in that age bracket, we are at 13%, and the others are more a little bit higher, 16, 19, 18, 20. So that tells me, as a, as a housing person, that um, our folks after retirement, after age 55, between 55 and older, they are tending to move out, all right? And, and they're moving at, at a rate that's a little higher than other towns. Uh, so that may be also, there's a lot of complexities to this, 
but I think it's just important for us to understand that 65 and older, we have about 13% of our population. So how do we compare to peer towns? Peer towns being towns that are similar in affluence, that have similar school systems, that are highly ranked, et cetera. How do we compare to those towns? So if you look at school-aged children compared to those schools with highly ranked, those, excuse me, those towns with highly ranked school systems, you see that, again, there's a very narrow band and we fall within that band. Concord being the lowest number at 17, but all the others between 21 and 23. Identical demographic profiles. Okay. In terms of commercial, industrial versus residential, we have 84% of our revenue comes from residential real estate. If you look at the peer towns, and the peer towns are the ones that remember we're defining peer as having highly ranked school systems, you see that they are almost all residentially dependent and many of them in the 90% or above category. With the exception being Westboro, but you've got to remember Westboro has Route 9. So that tends to add a tremendous amount of commercial industrial revenue to their, to their pocketbooks. Then we want to look at, well, how good a job is our school system doing relative to dollars spent? Because that's the, the, the business person's approach to schools. It's not the educator's approach, but it's the business person's approach. And you can see that we're spending just under $15,000 per student to educate. But that also falls, with the exception of Concord, which spends an enormous amount of money. And as a former school teacher, I can tell you Concord has always had the highest paid teachers in the state. So that may account for their 19, almost $20,000 per pupil. But you can see that most of them fall within that 14, 15,000. Wayland also tends to spend a lot of money. Um, on, their, on their teachers, and the teachers tend to be, the teacher's salary tend to be the swing in, in that dollars per, per pupil. Peer towns, how much debt are we carrying? Now we have gone through, since the year 2000 in that area, in the last 20 years, we've gone through an amazing building program here in the town for municipal buildings. You know, we built the Hopkins School, we built the high school, we built the Marathon School, we, at one point, we built the fire station, which has been renovated a couple of times, the police station, we built a library, we built a senior center. So there's been an enormous amount of municipal spending. That has resulted in us having a debt, um, as a percentage of budget, of 11%, a little over 11%, 11.6. So we're looking at you know, $12 million in debt that we're carrying on an ongoing basis. So as we look ahead and we know that we have another school coming up, we also are going to be rolling the high school off of the debt ratio. They'll, that'll be paid off in a year or two. So the municipal finance folks tend to look at overall debt. What can we, what can we use? What can we maintain? What can we sustain? And what's coming off the books and what are the future needs as well? Um, and we also, I forgot to mention, we also had built a DPW in the past two years. So a bit of history here. Uh, if you look at the population growth over the last 30 years, 1990, you can see it has been gradual but consistent. <coughs> All right. In 1990, we were a town with an enormous amount of open land. We were not built. We were like the last town out. You know, when I coached at the high school and we were in the Tri-Valley League, they used to call us the farm stand. You know, we were out in the farm stand. Because the other towns closer in had all developed chronologically a little bit earlier. Medfield, Westwood, Holliston, they all developed earlier. And then the growth got out to 495. And between 90 and now is when we've experienced our most significant <laughs> growth. And that growth has gone from about seven, eight thousand to about eighteen. You can see the percentages in ninety-five between that five years it went up seventeen percent. Our big building was between ninety and two thousand when we increased by thirty-five percent. And then it's been fairly consistent but a lot slower since two thousand. The population change at that period, you can see that there's the increase over the previous period is in red and then the percentages are in the in the blue and that kind of mirrors the, the whole growth, you can see that it's been very gradual but very consistent. The number of residential building permits. This is really interesting to me, to most other people, they don't care about this chart. Um, so I'll just kind of point out a couple of things about it that you should be aware of. 
The green bars represent single family homes, number of permits that are for single family homes. And you can see between 90 and kind of 2003 is when we did most of our single family home development. Uh, from there, you go to the orange charts and you start to see condominiums start coming in. All right, and that began, I don't know, back in 86 when we did Indian Brook and we started doing some other things from there. But then from 2013 on, you see that the green bar is very small. There aren't that many single family homes being built, but you have legacy farms, which is the orange, which is all the condominiums. So the blue, you see two big blue spikes there, one spread out over two years and one in 2016. Those are the apartment complexes that were built in town. In 2012 and 13, those are the apartments at Legacy. And then in 2016, those are the Madeira apartments down behind 110 Grill. So those will be a big spike because when you build apartment buildings, you build 300 at a time. You don't build 10, you know. So that's why you'll see those in, in very dense time periods. So in terms of Hopkinton, the planning and management, my company, uh, we cover 28 towns in Metro West. So I get to kind of see a real snapshot of many, many communities. Um, I chose to live here. I used to teach here. I am totally biased about Hopkinton. I make no bones about that. We are one of the best managed towns around. I know you all have your personal gripes, okay? Everybody does. You should go to some of the other towns, all right, and hear what they have to say. So we've done a pretty good job in terms of our management of this. And I want to talk about some of the things that have been done. Um, I forget when we, Finn, you may know when we brought in the open space bylaw. Uh, 89, or 89 or 90 and that bylaw allowed builders to build houses on smaller lots but they had to donate surrounding land back as permanently deeded open space as a result of that one bylaw we have over one square mile of open space that came about because of that now what does one square mile mean in terms of Hopkinton well we're 27.2 square miles total we are a very large town geographically very large town. That does not include the state land, and the state of Massachusetts is the largest landowner in Hopkinton. The second largest landowner is the town of Hopkinton. So we have a tremendous amount of open space, and we are now working as a group in town that's working very hard to connect that open space via trails, etc. And one of the things that the growth study committee is looking at is to increase our reputation as a physically fit town with lots of hiking and walking trails. And we have the ability to do that. We have a tremendous amount of open space. And it's come about because of these really boring, mundane things like bylaws and how they came to affect where this open space would be. If you look at, uh, you're going really fast on me. Right? <laughs> if you look at some of the, uh, <coughs> some of the things that have occurred, we have open space. This is all kind of stuff for those of us who are in the development area. Um, in, in terms of how do you control development, how do you manage development, establishing historic districts, uh, purchasing the Fruit Street property. There's a whole bunch of history that has occurred that has gotten us to the place where we are now. I think the point the growth study wants to emphasize based on our research is that this did not happen chaotically or haphazardly. It actually happened very systemically with laws that kept getting overlaid more and more. That by the way, when people come to the town and say, I love this town, I don't want to see it ruined. Well, you love this town because of what's been planned and what's been done and how it feels and how it looks. One of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is that change is inevitable. Ask my knees, change is inevitable. And it's inevitable for all of us. So how well do we manage this? And I think we've done a pretty good job here in town. There's also 40 years of managed growth with sewer, you know, we, we brought public sewer into town. It went, I think downtown was our first district with regard to that, and then we expanded from downtown. Then it became ecologically necessary to do it around Lake Maspinog, where there's really small lots, lakefront <coughs> property, and we put it down there. We cannot sewer 27 square miles. We can't do it, all right? We would have no money, all right? And we can't bring natural gas all over town. We're just a very big town. But in those densely populated areas, we've been able to control that and really to take care of the ecological issues that come around private sewerage in real dense populations. So what does the future look like? 
We have, as far as Legacy Farms is concerned, there are 228 units left to be built. That's now down because some of those have turned over since October. And that's on the north side of 135, or what some people call the Ashland Southboro side of that. Um, those are being built out. So they're going, they'll probably be about 18 months to 24 months before those are finished. And then that's done. On the top of the hill, up by the gas tanks at the end of what used to be Rafferty Road, I don't know what they call it now. Um, Legacy, North. Legacy North, all right, up there. Um, there's a, a age restricted or 55 and older community up there uh, where there are 175 units that could be permitted and, and, and built. Uh, as far as the municipality is concerned, uh, 55 and older projects are more desirable from a revenue standpoint because they tend not to bring school children with them. And so they tend to act almost like commercial property where you're collecting the taxes. But remember, 49 million of our 90 million went to schools. So if I'm paying taxes and I'm not putting any burden on those schools, that's a plus for the town. Yes? Those um, 55 and plus over, what is the average selling price of those units? Um, I, I can't give you that data now because they've oh, just started, but they're in the five to 600,000. They're not, there's no new construction I know of that's inexpensive these days, you know, and, and that, that is the number that the market is bearing right now. Now, if the market turns mm -hmm. south, you'll see some lower numbers up there. If the market stays really the strong. The average is 550,000. Yeah, yeah, it's in, that, it's in that ballpark. Okay. So one of the things that we're learning is that um, as the market fluctuates, we, so again, if, if I can remind you that I, I do a lot of communities in Metro West and when, when 08 hit and, and a lot of things happened, a lot of communities were affected much more adversely than Hopkinton was. We, we took our dip like everybody else. We took our dip in property values, but our dip was much higher than, than the surrounding communities. And I think that had a great deal to do with our public schools. I think it had a great deal to do with our public schools because we were still considered a desirable town to be in and people willing to pay a little bit more to get their kids into a good school system and we see that consistently over time. So uh, what am I doing with this? Oh, these are the number of occupancy permits that were issued for Legacy Farms and at the end you can see that there's in orange there's the 228 permits remaining to be uh, built and then 175 of the uh, age restricted uh, units that are going to be built eventually up there. The percentage of Hopkins Public School students as a percentage of population, remember I told you it's pretty consistent at 23%. This is from 2004 to the present, the last 15 years. The, while the population has increased, the raw numbers have increased, the percentages have remained remarkably consistent. And this is the legacy enrollment in schools. You can see the blue numbers up top when it was first started in 2013-14 when we had 14 students come out of there. But as the number of units get built, the number of students go up that come from there. And we, I would remind you of that slide earlier on where we said the 0.6 students <coughs> per household was consistent uh, completely across the town, legacy or any other. <coughs> uh, actual enrollment over a projected enrollment. Let me summarize this chart for you. NESDEC has blown it every year they've done a projection. <laughs> All right, they just haven't been close to what our population, they've always underestimated and we've always come back feeling the pressure saying, all right, how are we gonna accommodate these additional students that their formula didn't account for? We are working very hard with the school department now to see if there's a way to accurately project our student population. Uh, trust me when I tell you it is much more difficult than you might think because it's really based on the individual circumstances of every house that turns over. School planning, um, as you may have heard, there's a need for a new school. Um, we're, we're at capacity. The school department is working right now on a study to come out. We know that in the future, when we built the high school, I was on that building committee. We built it to um, accommodate six new classrooms at the end of one of the wings. They are gonna build those six new classrooms in the, in the next coming years. Uh, to accommodate the student enrollment growth. The cafeteria, the gymnasium, the admin, that was all sized to accept those, the students in those six classrooms. So we're all set there, we just have to add those <coughs> classrooms. Over at Hopkins School, they need modular classrooms, and the Elmwood School, they need modular classrooms. So we're probably gonna be purchasing those if town meeting approves that, um, and then they will be in place until 
the uh, permanent facility is a larger facility is planned and constructed. Uh, public safety. Uh, there's a permanent, the public safety officials are meeting with the permanent building committee. We're talking about fire, police, DPW, all working in conjunction. Uh, needless to say, the onus on them has increased. Uh, I, I asked Mike Manser, uh, uh, highway department the other day, I said, about how many miles of roads do we have? Because we have about 120 miles now. So that's a lot of roads to take care of. It's a lot of roads to patrol. And if you go back to the 27 square miles, when each of us is out over towards Upton or towards Ashland or towards Holliston and there's a fire at a house, we want to make sure that they can get there. That's a lot of territory to cover. All right, so that, that's the onus that's on them. Uh, I was talking about legacy farms contributing to the costs of things like safety in schools. I understand that they are paying some money to the schools, and I'm wondering if you could specify what that is over what period of time. Sure. And also, are they contributing to the increase in public safety once the town, once their streets get approved? The yeah, Would so they're, repeat, they're... Excuse me, please repeat her comment. We oh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Don't know what your the question was, um, Legacy Farm, what is the agreement, the uh, host agreement we have with the Legacy Farm developer as to the increase in school population? How are they contributing to that? And then the second piece is, are there property taxes going towards public safety like the rest of us are going to public safety, even though their roads are not improved? And my understanding is that um, property taxes are property taxes. Once they go into the town budget, they're used for whatever the town budget is voted, has voted to approve them for. The acceptance of the town road would have to do with things like school buses going up there, as well as the maintenance of that road by the town departments. But the answer is, if you looked at it purely from a revenue standpoint, Legacy Farms is very revenue positive for the town. They contribute more than they demand. Do you want to, you want to, you want to speak to the... Uh, Write those down. The host agreement. The, the, the oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the host agreement uh, with Roy McDowell was that as certain thresholds were met with students, then he had lump sum payments that he has to contribute to the school department. If it when it exceeds X number, he contributes another. When it exceeds Y, he contributes another one. And I think he's he's owing us a few payments, if I'm not mistaken. All right. He owes us a little over a million dollars. Right. A lot of money. That's, that's a that's a fair amount of money to to be sitting on, and that's money that I'm sure the town's going to be looking for very 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 soon. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the the overview of where we are. What's our next slide? Oh, the police department's undergoing a strategic plan right now. They I think they've completed their study, but I, I don't know that it's been made public yet or not. Um, but they're going to come out. They're reviewing it in house, and then that will come out as the, their own personal assessment about how they stand compared to national norms, et cetera. And that'll be a valuable piece for them to be able to say, here's where we are. Um, we're also looking, the growth study committee is looking at what is remaining of developable parcels. And I will tell you, it's a, that also is a very complex question. You know, what happens with Liberty Mutual? What happens with the Labor's Training Center? What happens with the YMCA Outdoor Education Center? And there are these parcels that we are looking at right now, and we've got a map of what's owned by the state, what's owned by the town, and what these 50 to 100 acre parcels that are still out there, are some of them developable? Are many of them not? Is it wetland? Is it too steep a grade to develop, et cetera? So that as best we can, as best we can, we will project out and say, it's possible that this many homes could be built here or this many homes could be built there. Under the current zoning, you've got to remember, we can't project if zoning changes on a parcel. That's a town-wide decision that the town would make. But based on the current zoning, we can make some projections and say, here's what it looks like. Excuse me. Yes. I have a question about sure. the houses at Legacy Farms. Yes. In back of uh, going along the, the street that runs parallel with 135. Those houses are very, very, very close to each other. How do they get away with that when people in the rest of the town have to have X amount of space? Sure. Is there a difference in uh, the agreement, or did they just sneak those in there, or what happened? No, 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 no. They didn't sneak anything in. Well, um, no. Turkeys, that's 
Yeah, no, it's a fair question. Um, one of the things that was done when Legacy was planned was that the zoning was structured in such a way as to not put them on two acre parcels because that would have taken up a majority of the Western Nursery's land. What they wanted to do was to do densely, they wanted to bring them densely close together and then permanently deed the open space around them. So the, the zoning that you see there is what they were permitted to do. How did that happen? It was when done. Of, when the rest of the town doesn't have to abide by the same. Well, there are three or four town approvals that were done at town meetings that approved those plans. They were voted on at town meeting. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, on the north side, um, related to that question, on the sure. north side, it seems the buildings are even closer together and the streets are not as wide. So I'm curious again about uh, services that the town may need to provide to them and whether they have a different proportion of the dollars that they're paying sure. due to the possibility of. So the question is, is there a substantial difference between the north side and the south side in terms of density, width of roads, et cetera, and how does that impact cost to the town in terms of services and so on? I have to tell you that I'm not familiar enough with the actual plans to say what those differences are um, relative to the permitting process, but whatever was permitted will be accounted for with property taxes. Those property taxes will, they will be apportioned like the rest of the town. So for instance, if I live way out towards Upton and it costs the ambulance department to come a lot more to my house than it would to Grove Street, I don't pay any more property taxes. We all pay the same property rate, but the, the budgets for those respective departments have to cover all of those circumstances in the town. Yes? Sorry, Rafael, one for the developer who, mm -hmm. you know, the more units you can build, the more money you can make. Mm -hmm. Is there a payment coming from the developer towards those services to the town? So the, um, as far as I know, the answer is no to that. When you provide for an open space plan, if I have 100 acres and I can divide it up into 100 one acre houses, and then I come back and I want to put the houses closer together, I cannot have more houses closer together than I could have had on the traditional zoning. They have to be equal. All right, where are we here? Uh, next slide. Oh, commercial industrial. So how do we incorporate future growth into the town? Our town is very restrictive in terms of where you can put commercial industrial. It's pretty much along 495 South Street, along that area. There's a little bit of business district downtown. But beyond that, you have a couple of really weird kind of old spot developments like Liberty Mutual over off of Franklin Road. But there really is not a lot of growth in unless we change our zoning, unless the town votes to say, let's convert some to a commercial residence, which I don't think is in the cards. Um, about, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, we did vote to allow South Street to go from three stories to four stories on their buildings with the hope that if we could not expand out horizontally, we could expand vertically so that we could incorporate more revenue from the commercial industrial uh, area. So, I'm sorry, that was a little longer than I wanted to go, but um, I just wanted to give you a little background as to where we are so that now when you sit at your tables and you answer some of the, the strategic questions that the Growth Study Committee would love to get your input on, you'll have a little bit more background from which to speak and it may also generate some questions for you.